All right, folks, uh, we should get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, second session uh, of the morning. My name is Sanjay Sarma. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering and the vice president of open learning uh, at MIT. Uh, this session is about the virtual campus. And um, we have a really stellar panel here. And as I was preparing for this panel, I started looking at their resumes, and I realized that I would spend the entire one hour reading out their resumes. Uh, so instead, I, I abridged them a little bit, and I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists now. And then what we are going to do is have um, very quick five-minute presentations and uh, have a lot of discussions. So please prepare your questions and be ready to uh, come up to the mic, and we'll take it from there. So uh, our three panelists today are uh, uh, Professor Dr. Susan Singer, also professor. Uh, Susan is division director uh, in the Division of Undergraduate Education at the NSF. She's also the Lawrence McKinley Gold Professor, Biology and Cognitive Science Departments at uh, Carleton College. Um, she received her PhD from RPI, and uh, she's also a certified teacher uh, she's a developmental biology who studies uh, the flower, flowering in legumes and also does research in, um, in learning genomics. Uh, Su uh, Susan is, uh, has many awards. She's a AAAS uh, fellow, uh, the American Society of uh, Plant Biology Teaching Award, and a number of other awards. Um, and we're really pleased that Susan is here, especially because over the last few years, she's been uh, a real beacon for us in thinking about learning in different ways, in new ways, and sort of rethinking education. So I'm really pleased that you're here, Susan. Um, the second uh, speaker is uh, another uh, very uh, well-known and, and uh, uh, innovative leader in, in higher education. That is uh, Paul LeBlanc. Uh, Paul is uh, the president of Southern New Hampshire University, SNHU. He became the president in 2003 and has really transformed not just his university, but frankly, online, uh, not just in America, but he's had an impact around the world. SNHU has made many strides, both academically, but also in terms of innovation with, uh, with online education. Uh, before uh, SNHU, Paul was uh, president of Marlboro College, and before that, uh, he was uh, at Houghton Mifflin Company, and so he is also um, an expert in technology and education, and it's quite an extraordinary career arc that he's had. He received his PhD at uh, UMass Amherst, uh, his master's from uh, Boston College, and his uh, bachelor's at uh, Framingham State College. So thank you for coming to this event, Paul. I know it's Peter Zay. I know you have, both of you are very busy. Our third speaker is uh, uh, another a very uh, uh, well-known, uh, colleague, a leader in academics, and also a, a very good friend, uh, Anant Agarwal. Anant is CEO of edX. Um, edX, as you know, is the Harvard-MIT founded online learning destination, which has now reached uh, uh, nearly 10 million people, um, has more than 80 universities, almost 1,000 courses, uh, the leading, one of the leading uh, sites for massive open online courses. Uh, it's also not-for-profit. And uh, the edX software is, uh, is open source. Anant is, again, um, a very, very uh, accomplished uh, colleague. Uh, he used to be director of CSAIL. He is a serial entrepreneur um, with several companies, one of which is Tilera Corporation, which does uh, the Tile Multicore Processor and Virtual Machine Works, which is another effort. He has many, many teaching awards. Both Susan uh, and Anant also have uh, are successful authors of textbooks. And um, he's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and he's also, I should say that he's all, he also has a Guinness World Record, but you can ask him afterwards what that's about. Uh, anyway, with that, I'd like to kick things off. You know, we've really seen a, a, a spectacular evolution of what place means in the last uh, 15, 15 years. Um, actually, going back 30 years, but 15 years, I say, because this is the 15th year anniversary of uh, OpenCourseWare, which was founded here at MIT, uh, where MIT decided to give its curriculum away. We have our 15th anniversary celebration, internal celebration, uh, next week. But this whole year is being, uh, uh, we're remembering what, what started here 15 years ago. Open education and online education go back further. 
But with the launch of um, edX and massive open, open online courses, uh, with the work that SNHU did with other uh, vendors like Coursera, Udacity, there have been some very fundamental questions about what it means to be on campus. Many have argued that perhaps the campus is gone, and Tom McNanty uh, and the others, Mitch, Mitchell Resnick, and Saeed, and of course Christine said, no, 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 the campus isn't gone. The campus is very special. Um, and I happen to strongly believe that. Uh, but what has also happened is, in my view, a bit of a false dichotomy between online versus on-site. And that is, to me, sort of an unfortunate argument to have. The fact of the matter is, online is where all the magic occurs. That's where the discussions happen. That's where the disagreements happen. That's where the, the sparks of ideas happen. That's, when you meet, that's where you meet in a coffee shop and two ideas come together and a bigger idea forms. That's where teams are formed. Uh, that's where peer learning occurs. That's where we work with our hands. But having said all that, on-site is just this incredible tool. It is a tool that liberates uh, us in the classroom from doing things that we could do on online and leaves time for us to do the things we probably cherish more, which is you know, talking and doing all these other things. On the other hand, for folks who have limited access, whether it's a, um, a young woman in Pakistan or a working parent in Arizona, um, it, it creates opportunities that wouldn't otherwise have existed. It creates opportunities to sort of uh, finish up your degree, learn new uh, skills. Uh, for working professionals who are not looking for credentials, uh, it opens up these incredible opportunities to uh, stay, with, stay current with the times. I argue that within the next few years, every uh, employee in every company is gonna spend two hours a week upgrading their skills. You know, we are all uh, sort of, you know, we're, we don't realize it in my view that we're actually on a uh, treadmill which is sort of moving backwards, you know, as technology moves forward and we need to start running to even stay, stay where we are. And in some ways, online may well be the salvation for all these things. So if online is a first-class citizen um, in the education landscape, the question is what happens to the campus, what's hap what happens to the university? And many have argued that uh, the university becomes porous. Um, a few years ago, we, uh, MIT uh, commissioned, the president of MIT commissioned a task force to look at the future of uh, education in, uh, at MIT, and the task force report was published uh, about two years ago and we talked about the porous university, um, where education is diffuse, where education is unbundled, where you know, education is on demand, where education is just in time, and in some cases, just in case, to go back to Christine's comment. So these are very exciting times, and I think that the discussions have become polarized and, and they've become these false dichotomies, partly because our uh, taxonomies, our classification systems, our vocabularies aren't rich enough to capture the nuances that we will need to have really uh, rich discussions about this. And in the absence of those vocabularies, um, we will continue, in my view, to sort of misunderstand each other and things will uh, be uh, sort of misinterpreted. There are also sort of political ramifications and so on. So that is why a panel such as this uh, is so timely, and I think we will have to have many more such discussions to inform our, our, our vernacular in this new space. So with that, uh, I'd like to yield uh, to our panel. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Susan to give our first presentation. As I said, our presentation is about five to seven minutes, and then we'll go into Q&A. Susan. The clicker. Uh, we, we are missing a clicker. If someone in the back can find a clicker. Okay. Uh, we'll just forward. Maybe you go someone ahead? in the AV yeah, can. I'll go do that. Oh, it's on the table. There we'll you go. We'll find it. There. Terrific. Thank you. All right. I passed Great. my first test. So our, the challenge that Sanjay gave the three of us was to come up with three opportunities for online learning and three challenges. So I'm going to share opportunities that in of themselves are also challenges. The first is really thinking about the impact of globalization, right? Both the, the shifting demographics, not just in this country, but worldwide, who the lunar, learners are, and the economics of the different learners. 
and then thinking about how rapidly science and engineering are changing and the global problems that we're facing that require the best thinking of all of us from all different domains. And then the, the opportunity that this very, very rapid advance in technological innovation is presenting. So all really great things, but there are caveats with all of them. So as we think about the global challenges, I'd like to challenge all of us to think beyond courses or even modules and consider the online environment as a place to collectively address problems. And we think about citizen science, academic civic engagement, classroom learning, problem solving, crowdsourcing, all coming together. Isn't it possible for our students if they're distributed worldwide, to be coming together to solve problems that could truly make a difference and use this as a really creative space to advance multiple agendas. Now, that's going to require that we think about how to early on help learners become systems thinkers. And we're going to have to think a lot more about how we help people become team scientists and more convergent thinkers, just mixing people in one space doesn't magically make all of these competencies appear. And then as we think about those learners, we also need to think about in this time where we're so globally interdependent, what does it mean to help individuals learn to work together cooperatively from the get-go? And what does it mean to understand interdependency as an asset rather than a deficit? So this is going to pull hard on developing inter and interpersonal skills, right? Those non-cognitive capacities, not just the strong science or engineering mathematics piece. And who's learning? Where are they learning? When are they learning? And that gets us to think hard about things like language, because language conveys far more than information, right? There's cultural pieces. There's great discoveries about learning that are being made in far parts of the world that we don't actually have the words in English to understand. So how do we think creatively about language in this globally connected world? And then to push a little on the technological change, right? We've heard a lot of very exciting ways about personalized learning and the importance of good measurement that can provide formative, you know, quick, rapid, iterative feedback, and we want that to be at a high cognitive level, not just superficial details, you know, yes, I got the answer correct or I got it incorrect. And in order to do that, we need to take full advantage of these online platforms as research environments that we can learn about learning from, and I'm sure you'll hear more from my colleague, but to do that, we need a very robust infrastructure for research where across universities and other types of research environments, we can have shared tools and workflows. Some for you know, people that are just starting out are very specific with different tools lined up. Others are mix and match. We do this in genomics and other fields, but a place where we can really do the analytical work together rather than trying in isolated places to figure that out. And that's going to let us figure out how we can best integrate face-to-face -face environments with these future learning environments. We can figure out what's best in what context. How do we optimize that? We need to approach it in a curious, evidence-generating way, not just our best instincts. And that's the advantage of the technology. And then what I'd like to leave you with is thinking hard about how this then drives learning in a disaggregated way and what that means as we think about helping students that we may never even meet, we may not even know their real names, learn to be better learners. So there was a conversation in the last panel about um, do you need a curriculum? I think you know I would sidestep that and say we need to understand more about learning progressions and appropriate leaps in challenge and helping learners to figure out how to piece together all the different pieces of their learning experience. And I think that's at the crux 
of whether or not we're going to be successful with these online environments. So thank you. I've been asked to do the thing which I find most difficult in the world, which is to speak slowly. Um, and we have a counter, so I'm going to try, to try to squeeze this in and resist my temptation to go fast. This is just a little bit of a background of my institution, Southern New Hampshire University. Um, I think in the last panel, Tom talked about the ongoing importance of physical campuses, and I think he's spot on, and I think he's spot on for the reasons he cited, which that they are places that people go, young people go, to enter into a coming of age experience that is about being with mentors, learning what it means to be in a discipline, to pursue their academic experience, certainly, but if you go on most tours of most campuses, you will not hear a lot of questions about the academic program. Not because students and their parents don't care, but they give us the benefit of the doubt. And if you come to MIT, they know you're great, so they're, 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 they're good. So what are all the questions on most tours if you tag along? And I do this occasionally on my own campus. They're about coming of age. Who will I live with? Do I like the looks of the people around me? Um, uh, do you have study abroad? Do you have JV field hockey? Because I don't think I can make your varsity team, et cetera. And that experience is not going to be replaced by technology. That sense of community for 17-year-olds remains incredibly important. Now, the reality is that's a distinct minority of college students today. Only 28% of college students are under the age of 21. Only 28%. The great majority of college students are part-time adults. 4.5 million of them have children. 40% of undergraduates are working at least 30 hours a week. Um, and they're juggling work and family and lots of other responsibilities and trying to squeeze in their education. So they, um, they are the, so the great, um, not discussed enough majority of today's college students. But they go to institutions that have a very, very different mission, largely, than MIT. So in my institution, we certainly have a traditional campus, 3,000 students. We spend lots of money on the facilities. We think about what a campus needs to look like today. But the big part of our institution is our online operation, which has just passed the 70,000 student mark, the fastest growing university in the country these last two years. For those students, they've had all the coming of age they can handle. They're 32 years old, they're running home from work to go to soccer practice, get a meal on the table. Their first priority is their family, their second priority is work, and then they're trying to squeeze in their education. So the convenience afforded by online education is tremendously important to them, as is the cost, as is the credential that allows them to get a better job, to take better care of their families, um, and time to completion, because when they do this hard thing, this is really hard for adults to squeeze this in, it's because there's a certain kind of urgency or stress or pressure on them. They finally have to do this, right? So they are also, we build in very different ways in our online world for this learner than we do for the 18-year-old. And I think we sometimes muddy our higher ed debate and our policy discussions by forgetting that there are multiple higher eds. The third program that we've launched just two years ago is called, call it, modestly called College for America. So this is a competency-based education program, the first of its kind approved by the U.S. Department of Education. No courses, no credit hours. So, someone, uh, so what we've done is we've taken the, um, the credit hour, which is sort of the Higgs boson particle of higher ed. It informs everything we do. By the way, you know it was created to figure out how to pay pensions to faculty, never to be used as we use it today, which is to unitize knowledge, to allocate our physical resources, to mark student progress, all these other things. And the credit hour is really great at one thing, telling you how long someone sat. But it's not really good at telling anyone what you've learned, and more importantly, it's not very good at telling them what you can do. So um, in this program, 120 competencies for which you demonstrate mastery, and time is the variable. You can go as fast or as slow as you need to. This is gonna feel pretty comfortable, I suspect, to folks at MIT, because I think you've thought about competencies for a lot longer than most of higher education. This is a radical concept in higher ed, but it's one that's washing across our industry. A year ago, there were 50 institutions reporting that they were working on CBE programs. One year later, 600 institutions. If you read Inside Higher Ed yesterday, there was a long piece about Purdue with their new um, CBE program, blue chip schools, Michigan, University of Texas, University of Wisconsin system, all the way down to community colleges and everybody in between. So this is the sort of range of what we do. And our goals there are to have a huge impact on the workforce. So we wanted to get to 100, our goal, our enrollment goal is 100,000 students. 
Um, just a few months ago, Anthem Insurance, based in Indianapolis, has 55,000 employees. They embraced and rolled out College for America as their free college option to every one of their students, uh, employees. 35,000 of them have no college degree. They're stuck in the jobs, often not family-sustaining jobs. So here's the bet we're making about um, the future. So this is our, our sort of notion of today's higher education, campus-based, uh, sort of a faith-based initiative for the last 800 years. What do I mean? That if you had enough students with high SAT scores and high high school GPA scores and enough volumes in your library and enough great faculty with PhDs, what came out on the other end would be great. We had faith. And the labor market has largely abandoned that faith, right? So in a Gallup poll last year, 91% uh, of provosts reported that their students, their graduates, were ready for work on day one. 11% of employers agreed with them. That's a yawning gap. So 35 years ago, your college degree was a signal to the labor market that you knew things. We don't have that faith today. So now we'll talk in a moment about competence again, but really when you think about it, we did a lot of work on, on the gatekeeping function of the university. The major is essentially a pretty rigid track. I mean, we, notwithstanding electives and the ability to add on a minor, you're sort of in your major following that path right along. University is the conductor of that. We'll give you a little bit of sort of seasoning with internships and sports, very little career services, and then we'll throw you out, and then we'll become a welfare recipient asking for your money as we send you off into your careers and give you good Division I sports. Here's our bet of the future. Students in the middle, we will highly, highly customize. Everyone's educational experience could look different from everyone else's. Highly customize. We'll know a lot, we'll know about grit, we'll do cognitive mapping, we'll be employing the kind of learning science and neuroscience available to us today. Um, we'll know a lot about what you need. And the idea, by the way, that as lifespans approach 100 years, that we'll only take 4% of that time to do education, really it's kind of an antiquated notion. So where you are, when you are, when you need us to curate for you your learning, and everything is a potential learning opportunity if you're mapped to competencies, and competencies become the new exchange rate. So in our institution, we're actually mapping the competencies associated with being a team captain in sports. We're mapping the competencies if you're a student government treasurer who manages under $2 million a year. There's real competencies to that person's work. Um, we were with one of the war colleges yesterday who spent a day with our competency-based team. They were saying you know, they have officers coming to the war college with 20 years of leadership experience in the field who have planned major campaigns and they make them sit through a planning course. Right? So if we know what the competencies are and can measure them, we don't need to make people sit through to waste time. Um, and then the idea is we translate that and we move into all sorts of credentialing and that that potentially becomes a lifelong relationship with people going in and out of the system. So, so when your MIT graduates leave, how often will they come back and for how much, what kinds of learning? And that's quite varied. So this is, our, this is our bet. And we think online learning is sort of the critical piece in the non-residential future for the bulk of college students in America. Sorry, rushing. <laughs> You're welcome. You can actually leave the previous slide up there. Um, I don't have any slides, but uh, um, I thought I'd talk, uh, talk a bit about, as Sanjay asked, uh, charges us with. Um, what do I see as some of the key opportunities with technology-enabled online learning? And what I might see as the challenges? I'll twist it a little bit. Of course, in terms of opportunities, I see a lot of opportunity. We can increase access to learning for people all over the world. Uh, on edX, uh, you know, as Sanjay pointed out, we have uh, millions of students all over the world. Uh, uh, so as an example, we have uh, a, a young mother from Pakistan who had to leave for high school in ninth grade. And uh, now she's gone back to learning uh, once she discovered uh, online courses on edX. Um, but I won't talk about access. We can increase the quality of learning, both on campus and online, by bringing all kinds of new tools and technologies to really improve the whole learning experience. But I won't talk about quality. Instead, I'm going to focus on one thing. I'm going to focus on a really big opportunity in front of us with online learning. And that is innovation in education. Because at some level, if online learning and online technology can enable us to innovate rapidly, then everything else will come through. Our education system, as Paul pointed out, uh, whether you, we can quibble about 800 years or 750 years, whether you're from Bologna or from Oxford, uh, but the point is that 
innovation has largely stayed clear of our universities. So we innovate dramatically rapidly in research, in technology on our campuses. But for some reason, we've just not been able to innovate at anywhere close to the same pace in education. For some reason, education hasn't been important enough for us to innovate in that field. And so i just give you a couple of examples. Uh, as Paul pointed out, we have this magical notion of students who go to college at age 18 and then spend four years in college and graduate. Now, that was great when people had lifespans of 40 years and we were looking to transfer people from an agrarian culture to an, industri to an you know, uh, industrial culture. But today, uh, Megan Smith, who's the CTO of the White House, says you know, within 50 years, um, it would not surprise us if people live to 100 and 150 years. And as Paul pointed out, it is senseless, it is, it is unimaginable to think that you could learn for four years at age 18 that would help you keep pace for the rest of your life. So let's just look at an example. The word, the, some of the biggest jobs, the largest number of jobs in, in our country today are in data science. There's hundreds of thousands of jobs available, unfilled. I heard of the word data science for the first time around 2008. So this was eight years ago. So some of the, the hottest areas where the jobs are were not invented more than 10 years ago. Take programming languages, you know, Ruby on Rails, or tons of jobs in these areas. A lot of these have happened in the past 10, 12 years. But the education system is once and done. You educate when you're age 18, go to campus for four years, and then you move on. But the world has changed. That was great 300 years ago, but it is not right anymore. So why can't we innovate? So why don't we have a model where there is somewhere in between, you know, you go to college for four years at age 18, and already the market is talking about it. As Paul pointed out, only 25% of the learners in the United States fall into that you know, category of learners who go to college at age 18. People are taking many other varied paths through college, but that is the model we have. You want to get a master's? Uh, well, you go to campus for a year or two years and get a master's. These are the two things we have. But the world is clamoring for something in between, something more modular, something that you can do flexibly, something that you can do anywhere, anytime, even just in case. But we don't have a way of innovation. So I'll give you one example with online learning. This is something that uh, Sanjay Sarma here, you know, he was the pioneer of this and really led the effort for something called the MicroMasters. So it's just a simple idea. Innovation in education through online learning. You can come to campus and do a master's degree for $70,000 and spend a whole year doing it, which is great. And you, uh, three out of uh, maybe 10% of people who apply are admitted. With the MicroMasters that uh, MIT launched on edX, MicroMasters is a piece of a master's. It takes roughly a semester's worth of courses, and the credential you get at the end is called a MicroMasters. It's a novel digital age modular credential. No admissions. Anybody can come and do it. Take as much time as you want. It's flexible. There's a capstone exam at the end. It's competency-based. You can just seat time can be anything. Oh, and by the way, you can learn for free. When technology enables zero marginal cost, ZMC, zero marginal cost for education, how cool is that? So anybody can come and learn, for example, in this uh, the MicroMasters, uh, the pioneering one from MIT on supply chain management. You can come in take uh, five courses completely for free and learn. You want a credential called the MicroMasters, you pay on the order of $1,000, which is you know, almost 1%, 1% of the campus credential just for the credential. You can learn for free, no admissions, and come and learn. And you graduate, you get a MicroMasters. That is not a four years on campus, it's not one year on campus, it's a new credential, it's modular, and you can do it completely flexibly and online. The story doesn't stop there in terms of innovation. MIT will use that credential and the performance of the student in that MicroMasters and uh, consider that for admissions into MIT if uh, the learner chooses to. And if the learner comes to MIT, then they will have an accelerated path to a master's. Instead of taking one year for a master's, this will convert up to a semester and they take half the time, half the price for a master's. Now that is innovation and enabled by technology. The last couple of, uh, last minute, let me talk very quickly about what are the challenges to this. 
And the challenges to this are not technology, it's not money. Frankly, it's finger pointing. So but when we talk to, uh, in my role as uh, CEO of edX, I talk a lot to university leaders, faculty. I'm a faculty member, so I can crack faculty jokes. Uh, students all over the world, corporations, policymakers, uh, the department, accreditors. And the funny part is everybody points to each other as slowing innovation. So I'll give you an example. I talk to faculty uh, without naming who or where or which university. And faculty, you say, ah, our leaders are not innovative enough, not fast enough. We want innovation. We want speed. Okay, then I go talk to the university leaders. And they say, oh, we have all these fantastic ideas, but faculty governance is just slowing everything down. Nothing happens. We can't innovate. Okay, then I go talk to uh, faculty. And, and leaders, and together they point to accreditors and say, oh, the accreditors won't let us do these things. I go talk to the accrediting agencies like NIASC and others. They say, no, we want innovation at the universities. Why aren't universities innovating? We are behind them. And then together they all point to the Department of Education and say, those guys stall uh, innovation. Now Paul spent a whole you know, three or four months at the Department of Education and they're looking for innovation. They say, our whole system is starved of innovation. And so I think our challenge is ourselves. Everybody's pointing at each other. Everybody wants innovation, and everybody points to the other as stalling innovation. If he can somehow get out of that and show some leadership, any one of these entities could create innovation in our system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Susan. What I'd like to do now is uh, uh, kick things off with a few questions. And um, if you have questions, you know, we'll sort of intersperse them. We'll get to your questions within about 10 minutes. So, so please get ready. So um, let me start, Paul, uh, with uh, you, you made a very important point about the demographics. You know, here we are at MIT, you know, all the great universities in, you know, within a 10-mile radius. Um, and yet, as you said, only 28%, right, um, are covered by, by, that, uh, by the demographic we target. Um, and I guess the question to you is, is this, is this the chief, is this the biggest goal of online, do you think? The, is this where we should really point? Because in edX, in uh, MIT students, the uh, median age is 27. Right. right. So we're also seeing this. I guess that maybe I'll, I'll ask the question differently. We assume that our students come in at age 17 or 18, they get an undergrad and move on. Is this something we should be prepared for, that even our students are going to, you know, do two, two years, leave for a startup, and then maybe come back, do something else? Is this the way the world is going for everyone, not just for the 30%, uh, not just the 70% who are not going to MIT? Well, certainly for online, historically and still today, the adult learner is the norm. It's never been about 18-year-olds. In fact, there's some evidence that 18-year-olds struggle more in online environments. While they are very technically and, uh, adept, um, it's a very different learning experience. There's a certain level of self-direction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, there's a problem. So I do think the interesting point for us will be, going back to your question, will be at the point when a residential campus unbundles the social coming of age residential experience from the learning and how the learning happens. And when that happens, I think you will see a greater mix if, if that slide was up. All those things that I listed, they could include MOOCs, they could include prior learning assessment, they could include military service internships. Because when you talk about competencies, you now have moved away from all of the um, mind-numbing conversations about quality and how you know. Because competency-based education really comes down to two really simple questions. What claims are you making for your students' learning, and what kind of rigorous assessment have you applied to that question? And if you can answer the second question well, and we don't, by the way, in higher ed, the state of assessment in higher ed is dismal, but if we get better at assessment, then we don't have to worry about how someone got to the end point. They could have lived on campus and learned in ways we don't even imagine today. And it won't matter if we know that they can do what we say they can do at the end, right? So I think um, we're still in a shift. So for 18-year-olds, um, I think it's gonna, there's an unabated hunger among parents to send their kids to great campuses. They can't afford it anymore in many instances. Um, and we have a crisis of business model that's upending most of higher education. Um, and, and online, I think, may help solve some of that problem as campuses come to unbundle that experience. I guess where I'm going with my question is, do you think that we're a little spoiled here? The that, place, uh, with that we're a little spoiled here at MIT in the sense that our students, you know, come here, they're here for four years, and then they go, go away to Boeing or Google or, you know, yeah. or Texaco. I'm wondering if perhaps even these elite students in the near future would, will want to spend two years here 
and then go to Shell or go to you know, Boeing and then want to continue their education. In other words, the students that you see may be not some other population, but maybe an indication of where our own stu students might want to go. So I think if, the, if, again, once we disaggregate, the scenario you describe is more possible. I still think that when you um, use Clay Christensen's jobs to be done lens on the question. So we had a three-year, I have an example of this. We had a three-year undergraduate degree program years ago uh, funded with FIPSI uh, funds uh, 16 years ago, and it's really successful in terms of the quality and, and people's sort of satisfaction with the program. And we could never get more than 30, 40 students a year to enroll in this three-year degree program, even though it saves 25% of the cost of a bachelor's degree. And, uh, and then we thought about sort of Clay's question about what jobs are people paying you to do? Well, if we thought about our undergrads, you know, they've been waiting with a hunger to get away from their parents, to live on a campus, to fall in love, to play sports, to travel abroad, et cetera. They've seen it romanticized in movies and books. This is what they want more than anything in the world. And what we were saying to them, hey, great, we'll give you 25% less of that, right? So when we sort of had this commonsensical uh, you know, realization, we simply flipped and said, um, three plus one, you live on campus for four years, three year undergraduate degree, uh, one year working on your master's. At the end of three, you can opt out if you want, but you have your four years on campus, enrollment shot up. Wow. Interesting. Right, because we figured out, so until 18 year olds don't hunger for that life that you, you know, that's a pretty great life on MIT's campus. Can, can I add though that I think we need to talk about which 18 year olds, because mm -hmm. if we start with the 18 year olds that are already here, and MIT does a wonderful job of supporting a broad diversity of students, so this comment is not about MIT, but about the population in general. Um, there's some very nice work by Carnavali and Stoll showing if you look at students in this country that are in the upper quarter um, in terms of their SAT score, so academically talented students, and then you compare those students in that group that are from the lowest quartile of families in terms of SES and the highest quartile in terms of SES, only half the students from low SES families are going to go to a four-year school at all. So if you start with who's there, you're asking and answering a different question Absolutely. than who might go there. And since the 70s, we've dramatically increased the number of um, students who come from affluent families that receive bachelor's degrees. We've gone from 44% to over 80% of those students. And we've moved from about 6% to 8% for our students from low income families. So there, there's a lot of demographic shifts. And as we're seeing the rapid shift now in the Hispanic population in this country and where people are located and where they're willing to move to go to college, I think we've got to look at, at that piece as well, who's, who's already at our institutions. Anant, any comments? Sure, I, I think the, uh, it's a bit of the chicken and the egg, uh, where our students have, high schoolers have grown up to believe that after 12th grade, you meet someone in the senior year, the first question you ask them is, uh, so what are your college plans? Instead, if you create a society where, while you're in high school, uh, you're taking advanced, maybe AP or other kinds of first year college level courses completely online, uh, maybe you don't have to start in freshman year. Maybe if you give them options, if people had the options available to them, well-publicized options, they could say, hey, I'm going to go uh, spend a year in Spain, in Madrid, and do some online stuff while I'm there to keep my parents happy, and then you know, do other things at night, and uh, you know, do some courses, and then come back and start in the second year. I'm willing to bet if you market that well, uh, you know, all kids would love to do that. Yes, because now do. they compress all their fun time in that one or two months between high school and college. Especially so I think if you do a good job, I think we can create other pathways. Especially if you talk about the nightlife in Spain, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, we've talked about competencies, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, and Paul, you've been a pioneer in competency-based education, but I'm actually going to turn the question to Susan and say, Susan, how can we, you know, there are some competencies, as you said, Paul, that are hard, difficult to assess, some are easier to assess. Where do you see the, the uh, assessment of competencies, the teaching and learning of competencies? Where do you see that going, you know, from your perspective, Susan? Yeah, so I think it's a really robust area of inquiry. 
And the trick is how to get out in front of it, which is what Paul was saying, right? So we know for some of the higher order skills that we value, right? And we think undergrad years are when you're building expertise. And that came up in the earlier session, but I really wanted to underscore that it's that those four years of college, expertise is domain specific. You build that. And by the time you're a junior or a senior, there's so many dimensions to that knowledge that it's hard to understand. We have tools like cognitive task analysis to unpack this, and I would say the Department of Defense has probably been the most advanced in doing this for their training and showing great gains, but we can't, we don't have the capacity to do that for all of our majors, all of our courses yet. Um, folks at Carnegie Mellon have been working to see if there's some way they can use online tools and mine the online data to you know, accelerate this. So I think it's an area where we need to work really hard on because it's an important agenda. We want to get there, but we don't want to default to competency-based education and be giving degrees to individuals or credentials that assess only superficial level understanding. So we've got to build the understanding exactly while we're building this. And I think that's much of the work you're trying to do at some yeah, point. I, I think you're absolutely right, Susan. You know, and my great fear about CBE is that we will see a proliferation of really weak assessment programs and, and then we'll just replicate the problems we're seeing in the credit hour based system. But if you think about where our lives matter, we do great assessment. Right, so we make nurses and doctors not only go through strenuous education and get good grades, but have to pass their boards. And even then, we're gonna keep them under the watchful eye of an expert for a long time, a lot of clinical hours before they get to sort of handle patients. If you think about pilots, it's great that you went to Emory, but you're still gonna to have to take your FAA exams and you're gonna be in a simulator and you're gonna sit in the right-hand seat before we ever let you sit in the left-hand seat. So our life matters, we do assessment pretty well, but by and large, if you look at assessment in higher education, from you know, a psychometrician and expert level, the expertise Susan brings, it's pretty poor. And if you shift over to performance-based assessment, which is inherent in competency-based education, it's dismal. Because competency-based really shifts the focus from, I, I would argue, from most of higher education, you leave us and we believe you know some things and we infer that you can do other things with that knowledge. CB says the opposite, it says, when you leave here, we claim that you can do these things and we will infer what you had to learn in order to be able to do it, right? So that shift of the lens really puts a lot more stress on assessment. Where we, can I tell you a, a, a positive example because I'm worried yep. here, we, I don't want to discourage people mm -hmm. either. We, um, at the NSF, we've run for 20 years a program called Advanced Technological Education to prepare community college students for these middle skills jobs. And we're seeing some beautiful work with competency there, but bringing in things like simulators. So demonstrating competency to weld and not just traditional metals, but composite materials and other things, working with this welding simulator to do the performance-based yeah. work. Or um, space tech, which is the actually only FAA-approved certification program for individuals to work in that industry. And the way, the reason I think these programs have been effective is their robust partnerships with the industry they serve from the get-go, and they're constantly thinking about what it takes to do it, but they're long-term investments. So we do have some good examples, in addition Absolutely. to the great ones that you offered and the ones that are um, in the um, defense industry. So we know we can do it. It's a capacity and a will issue, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of funny, I was reading somewhere, and I, uh, I should confirm it at some point, but I think uh, it makes sense that if you didn't have uh, flight simulators, uh, it would be very uneconomical to train pilots, right? Because if you had to do all the training in the air, it would be much more expensive, but flight simulators get you to a point where you can then fly with, a cope, with, a, with an expert pilot and sort of get there. Um, but that's, that would sort of make sense, and I suspect that's where you're heading at some level, right? I mean, is yeah. that what competency-based assessment is? Um, I don't know if it's, I mean, I think you're right about the, the savings, obviously, um, but I think it's about finding the pedagogical approaches that allow you to get people to competency, to mastery much more quickly than and traditional methods do. the performance assessment too. can be sort of on top of that. The performance assessment's that. at the heart of it, actually. Right. And, and when time becomes a variable, so our first graduate 
in College for America went from zero credits to an associate's degree in 100 days. And we charge, by the way, $2,500 a year, $1,250 every six months, all you can eat. So he paid $1,250 for an associate's degree. So when he was going through and we saw the speed, we thought, oh my god, we got this wrong. Like, he can't be doing this, right? This can't be like every critic in the world is going to sort of look at this and say, so we comb through the system. So let me just say very quickly about Zach Sherman. Zach Sherman worked from the 12, a midnight shift at a Conagra food plant in Troy, Ohio on the sanitation crew, minimum wage worker. He, as far as we know, had no wife, girlfriend, pets, or houseplants even. So no living things with which to distract him when he got home. He showered, had breakfast, and then spent every day on the system, eight to nine hours. Like we could see, right? We tracked, we have great data analytics, we're built on Salesforce, we know exactly what he was doing, when he was doing it, how he was moving through. He has a dedicated coach who was on the phone with him all the time. And so Zakwa had a keen mind. He like just a great, right? I mean, opportunity and talent, excuse me, talent and smarts is universally distributed, opportunity isn't. Zach is like an amazing talent. A voracious reader before he ever came to us. Um, and, and, he, um, and, and he could do the work. What he didn't have was money. He was dirt poor. And Zach is now in our bachelor's CB program, uh, has left ConAgra, is making a lot more money than he did before with his newly minted associate's degree, and is on his way to a better life. He's the exemplary case. We would argue it's just as important, to Susan's point, that when we make claims about our graduates' writing, if it takes somebody two years to get there, but we can stand behind that claim, that's critical. Why would we think that a writer could do it in 15 weeks of college freshman writing? It doesn't happen. What we do instead is we let them slide by with a C and move them along. And I think, you know, I'll do this exercise here. I do it all the time. I speak to rooms full of CEOs and HR directors. Raise your hand if you have someone working with you or for you that has a four-year college degree from a reputable school that doesn't write very well. Unless you're exceptional, usually every hand in the room goes up. Um, and, uh, and, and this is, I think, what's the power of this. So time doesn't become the question. Um, it really is, you know, can you demonstrate in a rigorous way that people can do what you say they can do? Got it. But uh, come, talking about assessments, and if you look at edX, one of the great breakthroughs was the uh, sophistication of the assessments. Um, where do you see that going, Anant? Where do you see, you know, will we have virtual reality assessments where you can really figure out if the student has you know, almost create a performance test. Is that sort of where I was going earlier? I think uh, it's important to point out that uh, today's online technology is not your grandfather's online program. We have come so far in the past, I would say, five to 10 years that it's absolutely unimaginable. And the confluence of cloud computing, social networking, video distribution at scale, game design, AI, have really brought a whole new level of of performance and you know, ability to how we can assess people, both the formative and uh, summative assessments. And so to me, what's really important is, and a big part of competency education that I like, is decouple education from seed time. Mm -hmm. That is, today we have someone go through a system for four months, and then we have an exam, and you come out with a grade. Simply put, why not make time a variable? Take as little or as much time as you want, and when you successfully complete the exam, call it a competency test or call it an exam, or it doesn't matter, then you get to the next level. That is what is important, decouple time. Some people take longer to get certain things, some people get certain things quicker. So just dilate time and, and hold a firm line on when someone is ready to go do a job or something else. To me, that is key. So what that does is it puts the onus on what that test looks like, what is that gate? Because now you're saying time could be anything, so I'm not going to let you sit there for six, uh, you know, for, for, for six months and then just let you go through. And so we've made amazing progress in what is possible today. Uh, it's not just multiple choice anymore. Uh, we can do uh, all kinds of things. And in the engineering field, we can do things like equations and um, all kinds of graphical approaches to uh, grading. Uh, image responses, which are critical for uh, the, the medical field. Simulation-based approaches where we can evaluate graphs and the outputs of simulations and processes. And even in the humanities, uh, we, can, uh, we can grade open-ended uh, responses like essays and so on through multiple approaches. We can use crowdsourcing through peer grading to grade essays. Uh, another approach uh, uh, that we prototype with good success is AI assessment, where you use artificial intelligence technology 
to create open responses. There, you use a machine learning system to be trained on the first 100 essay submissions based on a rubric supplied by the instructor. And then, based on that training of the machine learning system, you grade the next 100 to 100,000 essays. And uh, the results look pretty good, and we're just scratching the surface of what is possible. So this will enable us to build systems that can assess at massive scale so that we can even do a much better job of titrating the quality of what comes out of our education systems. So I, you know, I think uh, we're, uh, if you have any questions, if you could come up to the mic. I see. Uh, so I'm going to yeah. yeah. echo or extend a point that Anand made, which is I think you now 15 years ago when online education was really starting to come into the fore, the question we used to ask ourselves back then is how do we make an online course as good as a traditionally delivered course? And I would argue that today the question is actually reversed. Mm -hmm. We have better optics into quality assurance for our online courses than we do for most of our right. traditionally delivered courses. Here, That's here. not to say that there isn't bad online courses, but there's a lot of bad traditionally delivered courses as well. Terrific. So uh, I, if my request uh, to the folks who have questions is if you'd keep your questions very short so we can get a discussion going. Right. So. Um, in the comments I made before about virtual adjacency, uh, Tom had responded about the social experience of the campus. And that was essentially my punchline about the office building of the future being more like a club than a factory. Mm -hmm. What you're describing in this panel is the increasing quality of the online education capabilities, which I absolutely agree with. In many ways, the best lecturers in the world can be available to everybody on those person's timetable. So the question is, is what's the role of the campus in the social experience to complement the virtual world? It's not either or, it's some of each. Even if you're on a campus, you're still going to use the virtual world as a very powerful tool. So maybe you could comment on that synergy. Right, and maybe I'll just sort of embellish that and say, where is the, where the social aspect, the physical social aspect and the virtual social aspect, how, how do they play out in this world? Sure. Well, it's not lost on anyone that the companies that are primarily creating our ability to work virtually build amazing campuses, most of them in Silicon Valley, where they lavish amenities on people so they will come there, work there, and stay there longer. Right, so keep that in mind, right? And I, you're, so your notion of the social club resonated with me. Understand that the socialization that we talk about, again, tends to be for 18-year-old students, that 28% of students, the working adult has no time for socialization. They get socialization all day long, right? They're, they're yearning for quiet time, if anything. So I think that, you know, that's not to say that there isn't, in fact, great socialization that happens. Um, with our CBE program, one of the reasons we keep it very, very low cost is, of course, they're not coming to a physical facility and there's no instructional faculty. So there's a lot of peer learning and we work with large uh, corporations, Partners Health here in Massachusetts, the largest employer in your state, for example, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. But the workplace becomes the social space. Mm -hmm. So we've seen amazing stories, I know, people in a company say, hey, who's working on the math competency? You guys want to have lunch today? And so, so we get this kind of organic learning communities going, you know, happening. But adults don't need that. That's not the job they pay us to do. I, I Traditional would, uh, campuses will continue to offer that. If I could uh, pitch in, I would actually take the opposite view. We have to get some argument going here, Paul. We okay. can't, we can't all be agreeing so much. So, so I, would, I would take an exact opposite view of Paul. What Paul pointed out was that, look, online is where you learn and you do socialization on campus or uh, you know, offline, so to speak, and you go to, you know, uh, to a cafeteria. Uh, I think that is true, but I take a more a broader view, which is that we can do a lot better, and we are doing it better, with online social tools as well. And so, uh, my own daughter's example, you won't believe the fraction of time they spend with this little thing that's this big with a bright screen, where she claims to be Snapchatting, WhatsApping, texting her friends, uh, and she claims she's doing physics homework with her friends. But <laughs> be that as it may, I mean, you can socialize online. And on, just to give you one example, uh, we heard so much about this that we said, okay, we just have to go fix it. So on edX, we launched a new feature six months ago called Teams. It's very simple. What you do is you have a course, and learners find each other online. You can have a student from Pakistan with a student from Syria, the US, and New Zealand. 
uh, that, that discover each other, form a team of between two and 10 people. The virtual adjacencies here, it's not physical adjacencies, but virtual adjacencies. They form little groups and teams of two to 10. Professor, professors can issue projects. The teams can give the teams personas and names and have fun and then do team projects together. And we can do that all online. They get a private discussion area. We can do all of this online. We just have to innovate. Can I add a third please, please. perspective? Yeah. You know, just in terms of the pairings, right? So we started with social, being in the classroom, learning, being online, and Anant you know, said they can be both. I'd like to call out, and we're just starting to learn about this, we have a lot more work to do, that there are some kinds of learning that are actually different when you're physically interacting mm -hmm. with things. And I'm a, I'm a lab scientist, right? So you can imagine this is where my heart yep. would go. Um, but there, there's some really terrific work that's been done with the physics principle of angular momentum. So if you had a bicycle wheel with spokes coming out the side and it was spinning around and you turned, you could actually feel the forces there. Um, Sian Bailik and Susan Fisher in the Sh University of Chicago and DePauw University did a study of introductory physics students where some watched and some felt the, the system and then answered physics problems, including the angular momentum problems. Same, you know, no significant difference on the other physics problems. The ones that physically experienced it did much, much better on angular momentum. And then they pop them into a functional MRI, which you know probably some of you have been in these tubes where you, I get really claustrophobic. You're not going to be like removing your body again the way you did. You can answer questions using your fingers at best. Turns out that the students that watched actually long-term learn differently than those that experienced it by the regions of their brain that lit up. So what's happening online and what's happening in a laboratory, and think about MIT's work with minds on and hands on both, we need to work really hard to figure out what are those things to deepen the conversation, to include the social interactions, which are highly important, but not to let go of the cognitive piece and figure out what we really have to do in physical places. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that goes back to the competency, mm -hmm. right? You're not going to have someone fly an airplane solo after using a simulator, right? right? There's some steps in between. Driving test and driving, right? right? You don't and, want people driving with just the driving test. And we you don't want, even, I mean, with just yeah. the written test, you, you get them on the road. Right, and we still don't know if a simulator will affect your brain in the yeah. same way as actually yeah, doing it. There's so many really exciting questions to answer. Ma'am. Uh, I'm just curious to hear what you think of the co-op education model, where somewhere like Northeastern, um, there's more of a five-year track where for one year you work. Um, actually, go ahead, Paul. Um, so you're seeing, so I, I step back slow. I think the higher education has asked to solve many problems by our society, but generally speaking, there is one primary problem that trumps everything else from a policy perspective and how we think about what we do. So for a long time, it was access. How do we get more people into the system? And then we looked up one day and said, wow, we got a lot of people in the system, but 50% of them we lose. They don't graduate in six years. So then we started talking about completion. So Complete College America and all of these other programs focus on completion. In 2009, 2010, when the recession hit, everything became about jobs. And that's still the prominent, the dominant policy issue, societal problem we're being asked to solve. Co-ops have a sudden got new currency because of that, because we know internships are incredibly effective for routing people into jobs. So you're seeing people build new career centers, increasing their internships, moving towards co-op models, super effective. Now, I would uh, absolutely amplify that. And one could imagine that maybe all of education should be a co-op. Just imagine, as you finish high school, you go get a job, and you start working. And you learn online as you go in the job. And that's education. Now, why should you go and learn on campus for four years, and then spend the rest of your life working and not learning. Why not a continuous, lifelong, virtual learning experience and working experience? Why can't we intersperse the two? You know, worker by day and learner by night, or, or work and learn as you need. So it's really the, taking the MIT model of uh, men's at manas, you know, mind and hands, and actually doing things while you're learning. And what virtual tech, and technology lets you do is decouple space from knowledge. And so no matter where you are, you can still be learning from any university. 
And so uh, there might be a whole new model there. And you point out there's multiple models, right? And as you know from multiple working in the federal government too, right, we rolled out the apprenticeship model as a way to help um, middle skills workers start and have a really good job be going back and forth in the German model in the automotive industry. Right. Before you even start your training, you actually have your job and you're going back and forth. So I think it's not just co-op, although I was thinking, as you said that, you know, my nephew was a co-op student um, at a different university in engineering, my husband, my brother-in-law, who was my classmate, and all of them went to work in the companies that they'd had their co-ops. But the same can be said for internships, the same right. can be said for parlaying different kinds of more traditional research experiences. And we're seeing, and again, it's been in the community college sector where we've seen the most innovation, but you actually have in the actual program this industry um, academic link in Texas at the National Convergence Center and the Healers Center. They have a program called BUILT, um, which is really the business leaders group that meets with the program quarterly to make sure that the program and the current needs of the industry are aligned. There's a lot of sharing of equipment in this program um, every year, and it's across all of our different centers where the industry makes sure that the students are working with the current technology, not the technology you know that was set aside, sunset at 25 years ago. And so it's the relevance of the experience and lots of creative ways to get that. So uh, we have about 10 minutes left, and uh, I know Susan's got to catch a flight. So what I'd like to do is go into a lightning round. So if you can ask a very quick question, and the, we'll ha have One the panel give a quick answer. <laughs> and, then, and then on, then what we'll do is we'll sort of, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and uh, sort of instigate uh, a discussion here. So. There are qualities of a, a campus education that I don't think are fully captured by the coming of age model, and I think these are qualities you would probably all agree with. They are tolerance for people who have views and formations and cultural practices and so forth very different from your own. There's an ethical dimension to this kind of education, and I wondered if you thought that online learning environments have the capacity to develop those qualities of tolerance and compassion and contact with people completely different from yourself. Maybe Susan? Yes, yeah, so that was one of the points I tried to raise in the beginning. I think the potential is there. I've spent 30 years at a you know, small liberal arts college that embraces all of the attributes you're discussing, and yet as I think how diverse the world is becoming, the odds of meeting more people that are very different than you and have different experiences increases exponentially in an online environment. But I, I don't think it captures it in the same way, and I think that's the real challenge. We fund it um, so in the NSF, some folks that did uh, global entrepreneurship with students in New York City, um, community colleges and China. And then the students, they did all globally, right? Set up businesses collaboratively together. But the most valuable piece to them in the end was when they were able to do a swap and get together and meet each other. So I, I think we have to be really, really careful not to underestimate the value of that real human face-to-face -face connection, the, what, 90% body language conveys so much more than the words. I wonder if uh, online and the sort of diffuse education model that you're talking about, Anand, will actually promote more intermingling of people and more diversity uh, of experiences. Uh, you know, I think Susan made a, just an a, a excellent point, which is I think we should not take the view that it's either or, that it's not online versus offline or, or on campus. Really, it's about innovation in education. And we have both, we, we have all of these tools available to us. We have in person and we have online. Let's use both these tools and innovate, and particularly for to learn about diversity and tolerance. On campus, uh, you know, I go to certain campuses, you tell me which university, I'll tell you exactly what the students are gonna look like when I get there. Um, and so, you know, people, birds of a feather kind of flock together, particularly if you have a lot of money. And so, uh, so, uh, so on campus, you may not get that big diversity, but body language, you meet people face to face. And so, you know, uh, if the picture is a thousand words, maybe body language and seeing someone in real life is like 100,000 words. But online, the beauty is you get a much bigger diversity. I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a course on edX from Harvard on justice. 
And you should go into the discussion forum and see the conversations. It is absolutely mind-boggling. Because when you talk to a religion, for example, there were people from Pakistan, you know, the US, uh, Russia, everybody talking about things. And it is, it is sometimes inflammatory and sometimes scary, but it is intense. And so there's no way you get that level of richness and the connection and discussion that you might get on a campus or in a typical campus. So I think both are really important. And, and we need to find ways to leverage the best of, uh, best of each. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank this panel and the panel uh, this morning for thinking outside the box and for shifting the paradigm about education. I think that one of the things that seems to be a little bit out of the discussion in this panel especially is that um, we are talking about shifting demographics and shifting economics. So one, we are talking about 1% and 99%, and I think that there are issues that a lot of people feel left out. But secondly, we are in a very different age group. There are a lot of people throughout the world who have no interaction with online because they are in a different time frame. They never learned it as a child. So those wonderful things that were talked about in learning and being able to do as a child, if you have not had that training, you're not going to learn at age 50 or, or uh, you know, 60 or, or higher. And as we are living longer lives, we need that. So my question is, how are we shifting innovation to really address the larger communities? I, we heard about, you know, universities being more permeable, but really, are our universities permeable? How many citizens of Central Square do actually come to MIT? Do they ever? Did we invite them to this conference? I mean, I, I truly feel that we are not, we are the 1%. I am a PhD from MIT. I feel somewhat that the DNA of MIT is in me. I'm trying to solve problems of cities, homeless shelters and things like that. I don't have anybody listening because it's really difficult. These are very complex times and very complex pro problems. Are we providing online access to our immigrants all over the globe right now? So we have a very, very troubling set of problems that I'm hoping that MIT will help find solutions to. Well, let me, let me take a stab at that very quickly and just say that uh, uh, guilty as charged, I think it's a very important question. We haven't actually reached necessarily the least served. We have not. We are see, reaching, you know, his daughter and my daughter, right? We're not reaching a child in uh, in LA or in, in Atlanta who their life hasn't improved necessarily. Um, not that LA and Atlanta are great cities. Um, I I do think we have a lot of work ahead of us. I, I think uh, the good point, uh, but I think we need to be careful what we're comparing with. If you look at uh, the MIT campus or. Uh, you know, the Southern New Hampshire University uh, uh, you know, on-campus experience. Um, generally, universities have a limit on campus, 3,000 at SNHU. At MIT, it is 6,000, the 6,000 undergraduate students, or maybe it's more like 5,000. 4,500. 4,500 undergraduate students. And the fact that education on campus is expensive and you, and you do not, uh, you cannot accept more than you can, it necessitates an admissions process where you're selecting at MIT, I think it's 7% at last count of the people that apply. And of course, those that apply are already very heavily self-selected. But the beauty of online, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, uh, at the risk of sounding like a hammer where everything looks like a nail, um, with online, you don't need to have any admissions. Your doors are open, they're open to everybody. Like with the MicroMasters, you know, out of Sanjay's team and MIT and so on, there's no admissions. It's open to everybody. And in fact, uh, at some of our programs, the first person to uh, complete that was a kid from uh, Cochin in India. And you can never tell who will be the first one to complete something. And it's open to everybody in the world. Now, are you really reaching everybody? No, but it's certainly much better than you're reaching through campus. And so this is a really good way to amplify what you're doing. And I think we could do a lot more in reaching the truly underserved, particularly as the governments and the World Bank and others begin funding broader internet access and, and, and broader basic education in terms of in how to go online and find free resources which you don't even know about. 
Paul, you were going to say something? So I, I take to heart your question because we often say that our mission is to serve those for whom higher ed is not a guarantee, for whom college is not a guarantee. I won't comment on what MIT is or isn't doing, but I will tell you that if it does everything it can, um, it doesn't really address the issue even a small amount, right? So 1% of all college students are educated in the most elite institutions in America. There's a great piece on 538, if you know that blog, yesterday saying, please, or something like, stop talking about Harvard. Because the elite institutions, which are extraordinary places that do extraordinarily important work, aren't built to do, solve the problem you're asking them to solve. Um, on the other hand, there's enormous innovation going on, but the analogy that I think that is most useful in this is if you read Bill Gates' annual letter of two weeks ago, he basically does a sort of math thing. He says, look at all the conservation of the efforts in the world um, won't solve climate change. Our only hope, actually, is major technological breakthroughs on energy production in the next 15 years. It's the only thing. Technology is the only thing that, that saves us on this one. I would argue in some ways to solve the problems that you're talking about, the kinds of uh, technology that Anant and his colleagues and others are creating is really the only way we're going to get at this problem because you have a fundamental math problem in America. If you look at the Lumina Foundation data, we're going to need, we're going to fall 11 million college grads with short by 2025. The incumbent system, which already is not sustainable, can't produce enough graduates. We need 1.4 million uh, full stack web programmers over the next five years. Incumbent higher ed will produce 400. We'll be a million short, which is why coding boot camps are going through the roof, right? So you're seeing an enormous amount of innovation, most of it driven by technology. So, and I'll give you just one example, my own institution. Um, we just launched um, a, a, a program, a CBE program in a refugee camp in Western Rwanda with uh, funding from the IKEA Foundation. And what we're hoping to do is take what we learn in that most disadvantaged of worlds, I mean, the most searing place I've ever visited, but then the question is, can we take what we learned there and drop it into West Baltimore, which arguably is only a smidgen less worse than the refugee camps? Can we drop it into Detroit? Can we drop it into West Atlanta and other places? So technology is actually the only way we're going to solve that big math problem and the issues of equity. We're not going to do it by trying to build more campuses, and we certainly won't do it by asking MIT to be more liberal in its admissions process. You know, it's interesting of listening to the conversation, though. There's three things we want out of every higher ed experience, right? We want the affordability, we want the accessibility, but we want excellence. And I think that's why it's so important of conversations like this and why it's so important that, you know, the top tier institutions for research and teaching in the country contribute and are catalytic. It's why it's so important that we have the online. And as long as we have that conversation going and everyone's learning from each other, no one is ever going to balance these three legs of the stool but we can get better at all of them. And I think it's really important to keep pushing, but to be open and to value what each partner brings to the conversation that we really can learn and not make it an either or. Don't say, but I can give you, I can give you affordable, I can give you quality, or I can give you completion rates, but I can only give you two. Which ones do you want? <laughs> Right? That's, that's the sort of triad. That's it's really so really difficult to break through. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at my watch, and it's getting closer to Susan's check-in time. <laughs> so with that, and I hate to disappoint Gabriel, who's one of my favorite people at MIT. So Gabriel, why don't you come on over after we end when you can ask your question personally. But I want to thank uh, Susan and Paul and Anand for an electric discussion. Thank you all. Enjoy lunch.